In our line by line, verse by verse study of the book of Acts, we now come to Acts chapter 19, verses 21 through 30, in a study that we call the riot in Ephesus. So there's a riot that takes place that is covered today. And the subtitle to it is How to Be an Influencer for Christ. I didn't know whether to use how to be an influencer for Jesus or how to be an influencer for Christ. But today, there's an occupation where you can say, I am an influencer. What do you do for a living? I'm a TikTok influencer. I'm a YouTube influencer. I'm an influencer. Well, what exactly does an influencer mean? You are hoping to influence people in certain ways. This is part of our culture. 10 years ago, you would have never thought you could make a living by being an influencer. If you're a good influencer, you can make good money by being a good influencer. Well, I don't know about you, I'm not interested in being an influencer in the world except for being an influencer for Christ. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, how you and I, how Christians, influence the world for Jesus. We know that when we come to Christ, our lives are transformed. We know we're growing and we're maturing and we're learning, and this happens slowly, and I think for a reason, because if we all of a sudden had everything together, if we said, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life, and then you just had everything together, you'd probably be extremely prideful. But when we struggle to get things right with God, we find ourselves failing and coming back to Him and failing and coming back to Him. And by the time we get to the point where we've got things together, we're pretty humble about things. We're like, you walking with Christ? How's your walk with Christ? Christ going, by the grace of God, it's going good. Because I've had some struggles. All of a sudden, there's some humility that's built in. But not only does Christ influence us, but as we become Christians, we influence the world. That's what we see happening in Ephesus because the very last thing it says in verse 20 is, this is the verse before our text, is, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. It prevailed in all of Asia, which is, by, by Asia, they mean Turkey. So the entire region of Turkey, Ephesus is just a city that Paul is working out of, but it's so, the, the work of God is so incredible at that point that it prevails and it's strong throughout all of Asia. Anytime that you are influencing the world, you can expect them to be upset. Let me give you a couple of verses. First of all, Matthew 5, 13 and 16 tells us there are two ways in which we influence the world. You're going to be familiar with this, by the way. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its flavor, how will it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be thrown and trampled underfoot. So we are salt. Salt did two things in their day. It flavored food. And we as Christians bring a certain flavor to this world that you can imagine what it would be like if Christians were not in the world. If we didn't have an influence at all, the world would be lost because we are the flavor of the world. But we also stop corruption. Salt was used in its day to preserve food. They didn't have refrigerators, so they would heavily salt things, it would dry it out, and it would preserve food. So we are preserving the world as well by living for Christ. Then it says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Do, uh, do, not, do they not light a lamp? Or nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And if it gives light to all those who are in the house, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So not only are you salt that stops corruption and flavors the world in a Christian way, but you are light that brings the, the light of truth. So like a whole house is filled with the lamp that's lit. So in the world, the light of the truth of Christianity shines from us, but light also exposes. That's one of the reasons the world hates us. They're living in darkness and here we come light, boom. And they're like, shut off the light. That's way too bright. We're shining for Jesus and the world ends up hating us because Jesus said they love the darkness. No wonder they hate us if they love the darkness. So we are gonna end up offending those who are in the world. No wonder we're living in a world where Christians are increasingly being hated. When you recognize that you are being hated by the world, don't think bad about that. That's a good thing because you're shining for Christ. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And if you're a people pleaser, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, just personalities of people that don't want people upset with them ever, 
you're going to have to get over that because the world's not going to like you. And Jesus told us that clearly. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul came right out and said it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. They can paint me any way they want to paint me. They can make me look bad. You know, you're just superstitious. You just believe in the spaghetti God in the sky. You know, uh, God's for people that need a crutch. There's a weakness. Uh, you, you just give up intellectually to be a Christian. You can mock me any way you want to mock me. But I will not be ashamed of Jesus. I will not be ashamed of the gospel. And when we stand for him, we will influence people for Christ, which is what we see here in our text. Now, again, in Romans 12, 21, it says, do not over be overcome by evil. So there's evil in the world. We could be overcome by evil. Sometimes the evil of this world creeps in. The worldliness that's out there creeps into our lives until we are living worldly lives instead of living for Christ. Do not be overcome by evil, but, but overcome evil, it says, with good. So as we live our lives for Christ, we are overcoming evil with good. Not being conformed by this world, Romans 12, 1 and 2, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Once we are saved and we begin to think clearly, we begin to think rightly, we're now walking in the truth. The world then sees us and we are completely and totally transformed. Now let's take a look in our text at what happens. We got to get a few things out of the way first. We look at verse 21 of Acts chapter 19. First, it tells us about Paul's plans for the future. This is verse 21. And when these things were accomplished, that is the power of the gospel prevailed in all of Asia and did mighty deeds. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in his spirit, he had to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, then go to Jerusalem. And after that, I must, be, uh, I must see Rome. So Paul says this, I'm going to leave Ephesus. He's going to go up north to Macedonia, which is Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea are in Macedonia. He's going to go down Macedonia to Achaia, which is Corinth. Then he's going to go by Ephesus. Remember, he stops and meets the elders on the beach. We'll look at that here in a few chapters. And then he goes to Jerusalem, where he walks into the temple, ends up causing a riot and gets arrested and taken to Caesarea Maritime, which is a Roman city, kept there under protective um, custody until he appeals to Caesar. And when he appeals to Caesar, they take him in custody to Rome, where he stands before Nero eventually. Now, it gets a little muddy there. Nero will execute him. He, both Paul and Peter are killed in the great persecution under Nero. Nero lit Rome on fire because he wanted to rebuild it and the Senate refused him. So he burned down the section of the city that he wanted to rebuild. And when they blamed him, when it was like, this is a madman, he burned down the city. He said it was those Christians. And so he arrested Christians, famously had them dipped in wax and burned them as candles. There's, there's other persecutions that happened. Both Paul and Peter died under that persecution. So we learn what's going to happen to Paul as he talks about what he's going to do. Verse 22, so he sent into Macedonia, that's again, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, two of those who ministered with him, Timothy and Erastus. Now we're going to meet a few more people from Paul's team here. As Paul's been in Ephesus, the team has grown from Silas and Timothy. We learn about Titus eventually and Apollos. But now we learn about a new guy, Erastus. And we'll learn about a couple more here pretty soon. God continues to add to the team the work that God wants to do. And I love that God is continuing to add to our team here. New people coming on to do the work that God's called us to do to meet the city. It's a constantly growing thing that we become part of the team to do the work that God's called us to do. So he sends Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia where he's going to go first. And then verse 23, and about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. The way is a reference to Christianity. 
Christians were first called Christians in Antioch earlier in the book of Acts. Now we read the reference to the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it became known as the way. It's the way to God. Today we would say, are you a part of Christianity? In their day, they would say, are you a follower of the way? Which is radically different than anyone else. So there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines to Diana, bought, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. Now, they not only made silver uh, idols of Diana, but they made copper idols of Diana and other metals as well. And so there was a craftsman guild in Ephesus. Ephesus was a large, wealthy city. It had a wealthy quarter on it. The, the ruins today, I've talked about why we we're in the book of, of Acts, are absolutely tremendous. And there was a temple to Diana. That's the Roman name. Artemis is the, her Greek name. So there was a temple to Artemis or Diana in Ephesus. It was one of the ancient, seven ancient wonders of the world. If you've ever been to Ephesus, you can visit where it was. It was over 400 feet long, which was huge for their day. For their day, having a building that size was incredibly big. So it was over 400 feet long and over 250 feet wide, and it had 127 columns in it. I think if you go to the Temple of Artemis today in Ephesus, if I remember right, there's, I've only been there once, there's one column standing. They stacked up a column. Like they took some of the ruins, they stacked up a column just so you could get an idea. Here's where it was. It's not very influential today. We're going to see it was influential in their day, but it's not very influential today. Now, Diana was the goddess of the, of the wilderness, the goddess of the forest. She was a perpetual virgin, but temple prostitutes raised money in the temple of Diana specifically in Corinth, coming down from the Temple of Diana that was up on a, on a, on a, on a hill that was close to Corinth. It's, it's a very large hill outside of Corinth. And these temple prostitutes would come down into Corinth at night. So the morals under the Roman religion pantheon of gods or the Greek pantheon of gods that we call uh, Greek mythology today were, were not good morals at all. They were... They were as bad as the morals are culturally in the world today. The anti-God, anti-Christian morals of today, maybe even the Greek and Roman morals were worse in their day. We're not far behind. If, if Romans' morals were worse and the Greek morals were worse, we're catching up fast because our world has this darkness that is overshadowing it as we enter into the last of the last days. And there are passages that talk about that. So, um, they got money by making these idols. Now, what had happened with the gospel? The gospel's going out and people are getting saved. So people stopped buying idols of Diana. And Demetrius was like, we've got to stop this. This is hitting the pocketbook. So verse 25, he called together with the workers of a similar occupation. So the craftsmen's guild of making idols. Men, you know, that men, and then he says this, this is, this is Demetrius. Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. They'd made good money by making idols of Diana. Now, if you ever saw an idol of Diana, you would wonder about that. It's kind of wrapped up like a mummy, except for the chest that has the breast exposed, but there's like, I don't know, 20 of them. So it's just this weird looking idol multi-breasted, mummy-looking idol. They had their prosperity from that trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout all of Asia, this Paul has preached and turned away many people. So Paul has been an influencer on Asia. He's gone out and preached the gospel, being centered in Ephesus, and then sending people out. It has influenced the entire culture where now it's affecting the pocketbook of people who are making idols to Diana. This has happened over and over and over again in history. When John Wesley, who got kicked out of churches, by the way, he was teaching Christ as salvation, not church attendance or membership as salvation. And so churches kicked him out. So he went out by horseback 
and preached to thousands every city that he went to. And when he would hold his revivals in cities, the bars would close down. People would be like, we're not going to the bar anymore. And so bars didn't have any patrons. This has happened over and over and over again throughout history, where when the church gets strong, it affects the world. That's how, what is happening here. We have our profit and um, by, by this trade. Then he says, verse 26, moreover, you see in here that not only at Ephesus, but throughout all of Asia, uh, this Paul has preached, persuading people to turn many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of failing in disrepute, but also the temple of the goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all of Asia and the world worship. So his argument was twofold. Number one, we make our profit by these idols we sell and it's going to hit our pocketbook. Number two, our goddess is going to be despised. We can't stand for Diana being despised and being destroyed and not having influence around the world because she's worshiped now around the world. Where, where, where are the Diana worshipers today, by the way? Where are the Artemis worshipers today? Demetrius said she's worshiped around the world. She no longer influences the world. She did it one time. Verse 28. And when they heard this, they were filled with wrath and cried out saying, great is Diana of Ephesus. So that was their cry. So these craftsmen are like, yes, she's going into disrepute and, and we're not making as much money as we were. Great is the goddess Diana. <coughs> so the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord. So now in Ephesus, there's a theater that can hold 25,000 people. It's not surprising that the theater could hold that many in Ephesus because Ephesus was a big, influential city. Uh, when we were there, we couldn't go into the theater. It was being, they were refurbishing it, so we couldn't go in. But I'm told that when you go in, that the acoustics are fantastic. And that, that 25,000 people in that theater yelling, great is the goddess Diana, would have been heard throughout the entire city of Ephesus. It would have made something spectacular. So they rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, so they're from Berea, Thessalonica, Philippi, where Paul's going to go, Paul's traveling companions. Now we learn about two more people that are on the team. These guys are from Macedonia that are down in Ephesus while the gospel is, is being very effective. So they seize them. And when Paul wanted to go in to the people, to the theater, which I love that about Paul, Paul's like, I'm going in there. There's 25,000 people in there. I'm going to go preach to them. The disciples could not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia who were his friend, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. So some of the rulers of the city of Ephesus went and begged Paul not to go in. You know, Paul got himself in a lot of trouble. He got beaten, he got scourged, he got stoned. There's a lot of problems that happened. He's going to go to Jerusalem and get arrested. So it seems that they stopped him from doing something here. Some therefore cried out one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. So the craftsmen had rushed into the theater, but other people had swept in with them. We learned that the Jews went in with them. Verse uh, 33, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hands, and he wanted to make a defense to the people. So basically, I think what Alexander wants to do is go, we're not the ones doing this. The Jewish people do not have the same commitment to evangelism that Christians do. We've been told by Christ to go out and shine our light. The Jewish people were just like, you want to become a Jew? You can. But they don't have evangelism the way we have evangelism. So they probably wanted to do that. Now, Paul wrote to Timothy, who was in Ephesus when he was in prison in Rome. Timothy was the pastor of Ephesus at the time. And Paul said this about Alexander. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. This is 2 Timothy 4, 14 and 15. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Now, whether this is the same Alexander, we don't know. But what we learned is that Paul had an Alexander in Ephesus that did him harm. We don't know all of the story of what happened in Ephesus. Listen to this. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 32. Paul talks about this happening in Ephesus. If in the manner of men, 
I fought with beasts in Ephesus. So he's not talking about entering into an arena to fight animals, but in the manner of men, I fought with beasts in Ephesus. We don't know what he's making a reference to. More happened to Paul in Ephesus than we know. He says, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. So there were those in Ephesus, in, in, um, there were those who were teaching to Corinth that the resurrection didn't happen, that people didn't rise from the dead. And so Paul is basically saying, you might as well go out, eat, drink, and be merry if Jesus didn't rise from the dead because we have no hope. But he says that he fought beast in Ephesus. Now back to our text, verse 34. And when they found out that he was a Jew, this is Alexander, motioning with his hands to calm people down, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of Ephesus. Now they start chanting for two hours in the theater <coughs> when Alexander wants to address them, great is Diana of Ephesus. Great is Diana of Ephesus. Great is Diana of Ephesus. Well, today, her temple is not around at all. It was built 600 years before the time of Christ. It was destroyed in 300, rebuilt. It was destroyed again for good, 300 years AD. So it was around for almost a thousand years. It was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. So if you look up a list of that, you're going to see it. And now it's not there. It's a barren field with one column sticking up. Today, people would chant great about things in their lives. For non-believers, what kind of things would they chant as being great? Great are the Denver Broncos. Great are the Chicago Bears. Well, they're good for a while, right? But pretty soon they're not. Great is getting drunk. Great is alcohol. Great is partying. Well, for a while, until the partying affects your life, there's a region, reason that college students get into partying and then pretty soon get things under control because they realize what it does in their life eventually. What it promises to do or what it does for you for a while, it does not do forever. Great is making money. Great is making money. So you become really rich. You got all your money put away and then you find out that you have cancer and that you're going to die fairly soon and you realize I'm leaving all my, kid, my money to my kids, I don't think it's good for them to have money because you realize they're not going to handle it well. And so you try to talk to your kids as much as you can. Listen, when you get the money, don't spend it on stuff. You're trying to communicate to them, you know, because you know that the money could go quickly in the hands of someone who hasn't earned it. Whatever you're crying out great is today, is it really great? Will it really be everlasting? The only real cry that will last is great is the Lord God Almighty. That's what we ought to chant. Great is the Lord God Almighty. Now they're upset because the gospel has gone around the world and influenced the world. May God use us to influence the world that people in the world will get more upset at us. And they would cry out great is whatever it is that they're living for. Because whatever you're living for, if you are not a Christian, is ultimately as futile as Diana. Ultimately, it will end up the same way. Whatever you're living for will mean nothing in the end. There's a reason that wealthy people, that, that the suicide rate is higher. It's not a bunch higher, by the way, but it's a tick higher because money doesn't answer all your problems. If you need money, you're struggling, you don't have money, you think it does. You think it's going to. But when you have money, you'll realize now you just got to worry about keeping the money. I made the money, now I got to keep the money. I have a friend of mine who's a doctor and he tells me, I don't need the pile to grow anymore, I just don't want it to shrink. <laughs> so you just kind of move from one place to another. It doesn't bring the fulfillment that Christ brings. So they cry out, great is the goddess Diana for two hours. Verse 35, and when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know the city of Ephesus is the temple and the guardian of the great goddess Diana and the image which fell down from Zeus. So they had a meteor that fell down to the ground and they thought that was Zeus giving his approval to Diana. And that's their evidence for serving him. Are you sure what you believe is true? If you're a humanist, if you're an evolutionist, 
If you're a materialist, you believe that it's only materialism. If you're a humanist, you believe in the human spirit. If you're an evolutionist, you believe that everything evolved on the earth out of nothing. You, you stand out on a, in, in a place where there's dirt and you believe you, if you make mud, that that is the beginning of, our, of, of us. Mud and dirt together, give it time and we'll evolve out of it. You believe all of those things. There's some superstition to all of them. Now you'll say to me, but you believe in God. You believe in the, the, the giant spaghetti God in the sky. Well, I understand what you think, but I have more evidence for what I believe. I have faith. I trust in the evidence that I see, but I trust in God. We all live by faith, whatever it is, because the fossil record doesn't show evolution. You have to believe by faith, you have to trust by faith. And so they believed that uh, uh, this meteor fell down from the sky. Therefore, they knew Diana was true. Now, therefore, since these things cannot be denied, really? You think a meteor proves that Diana was actually a goddess and they can't be denied? I hear that today, <clears throat> today. I hear it from, from humanists and evolutionists. It cannot be denied. Evolution is true, it can't be denied. Oh, good, show me the proof. I'm all ears, I'm ready. Show me the evidence. Well, it's too complicated, you can't understand it. Give it a try. Give it a try, just dumb it down for me. There's no evidence. These things can't be denied, but they don't have evidence. They say, well, there were short-necked giraffes and long-necked giraffes, and then the, the vegetation was up so high, only long draft and neck, left neck giraffes could reach it. So all the short neck giraffes died out. The gene pool for the short neck giraffes done. And now it's only long neck giraffes. Bingo, there's evolution. Really? Did it, become a different, did it become a different creature? Or is it still a giraffe? When you check the DNA, is it a, is it a chimpanzee? Is it an elephant? Is it a, is it a giraffe where, how does that, that, that's adaptation. We all agree with that. We all agree that if you have a certain gene that makes you more survivable, then you're gonna survive in adverse situations. God created men and, and animals that way so that ones with stronger genes in certain situations could last longer than others. That's adaptation, that's not evolution. The idea that you can have a giraffe that turns into a new creature, whatever you want to name it, um, Humphalumphagus, I don't know, whatever you want to name it, is not proven at all. And neither is adaptation proof for evolution. So verse 36, therefore, since these things cannot be um, denied, you ought, to, um, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of, of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, uh, the courts are open and we have proconsuls. Let them bring their charges against one another. If you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly, for we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. There being no reason which we can give an account for this disorderly gathering. So they're under Roman control. There are Roman guards around. They're seeing this disorderly group and they're, they're, they don't have a permit. Now, Rome didn't get permits. I'm using that as an analogy. But they don't have a permit for a gathering. This is a disorderly gathering. And when they had said these things, they dismissed the assembly. So nothing happened from it. But the fact that we see that the gospel influenced the entire world is the same that is true today. Let me just think about this in closing. Let me just, let's think about this in closing. In 1985, there was a poll taken and uh, whether or not, what religion you were in America. 90% of people said that they were Christian. Today, a poll was recently taken and the number was under 50%. And so people say we are living in a post-Christian world because 90% said in 85 and 50% say in 2022 or 2023, whatever the day was. Do you think that's really the case? Do you think that in 1985, the people who said that they were Christians, 90% were really Christian? Do you think they had a real genuine relationship with Christ? 
Or do you think it was under 50%? In our world, if people are recognizing I'm not a Christian, and now there's a smaller percent who say they are, I don't think that's a post-Christian world. I think it's a, it's a pre or a post um, honesty world or a post not a non-honesty world where they said they were Christians before, now they realize they're not. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. I would that every believer, every so-called Christian would only call themselves a Christian if they are born again, if they have eternity, if they've really become part of the, the body of Christ, if they've really been born again, that only born again Christians would say, I'm a Christian. Then they would know where they stand. Because in 85, you'd say, you need to become a Christian. They're like, I'm already a Christian. What are you talking about? But today, under 50% will say they're Christian. So we can now talk about what reality is. You need Christ. You need to become a Christian in order to be saved. You will one day answer to God. And if you're here today and you've never invited Christ into your life, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that so that you can be a follower of Jesus, so you can be filled with the Spirit, so you can be an influencer. You might be an influencer for Christ on TikTok, if you still can eventually, or you might be an influencer for Christ on YouTube, but you will be an influencer to the people around you for Jesus Christ. And that's by the power of the Spirit that's been given to you, because you are the light of the earth and the salt. You are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Stand with me, would you? And let's pray together. Father, thank you for the time that we've been able to spend in your word here today. And we do want to be an influencer for Christ and forgive us when we've called out great is whatever that we're living for. For we realize that all of these things will come up empty in the end and that the one, the true one who is great is you. And we thank you for this in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.